from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the reading promotion arm of the library. Uh, we operate around the country through state centers for the book. Each state now has a cooperative center that helps us promote books and reading in that state. And in particular, we ask them, and they, by their nature, take a close look at the book culture of that state and promote often the authors of the state. Turns out to be a wonderful activity for each of the state centers. Uh, we also have reading promotion partners with national organizations. Uh, we're also involved here in Washington uh, with the National Book Festival, which is going to be having its 10th anniversary this year on the Mall on September 25th. So I hope um, all of you will mark your calendars. Here at the library, however, we focus in part on, I'd say largely really on Books and Beyond Talks, which uh, are noontime talks. Thank you for joining us today. Noontime talks about books uh, recent books that have something to do with the Library of Congress, and often it can be the collections of the library or it might, they might result from a project with another part of the Library of Congress. Most of these are co-sponsored with another division of the library, and today I'd like to acknowledge uh, the help and co-sponsorship of the manuscript division, uh, particularly Len Bruno, who is the historian in charge of in my eyes, the history of science in the manuscript division. And it was Len who suggested that we have uh, Larry Ties here as our speaker to talk about, as you will soon see, and hear uh, not only his research on the Wright brothers, but uh, his, his research in general. Uh, the Center for the Book has a schedule of public events on our website, and there, when you go out, there are piles uh, on the table where we'll be having the book signing uh, at one o'clock. Uh, we also have information about a new development, a Books and Beyond book club on Facebook, where you can learn about uh, past talks, uh, converse with other speakers, converse with future speakers. We understand one of our future speakers has signed in on Facebook to establish his contact with us. Uh, we also film this particular uh, series for the Library of Congress's website. It's being videotaped, so I have to ask that you all uh, turn off all things electronic. Uh, we will be having a short question and answer period between Larry's talk and the book signing. And if you have questions, uh, pl please uh, don't hesitate, but your asking the question will make you part of our webcast uh, with if everything works out fine. So you will uh, be part of the Center for the Book's history, and I urge you to be, become part of it in that way. I will let our speaker explain to all of us why his book, Conquering the Sky, has the subtitle, The Secret Flights of the Wright Brothers at Kitty Hawk. And you can also obtain an excellent summary of the book uh, from the library's news release, which was prepared by our communications officer, uh, the talented Guy Lamalinara. Guy, thank you so much. Our speaker, Larry Tice, was described by one of this book's many favorable reviewers as a dogged researcher, a mesmerizing, mesmerizing storyteller, and a human encyclopedia on Wilbur and Orville Wright. Larry is a historian and an author of more than 50 articles and books, on subjects on, on many different subjects, uh, including the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin, aspects of slavery, and the history of North Carolina. But it's the Wright brothers, and of course the Library of Congress's extensive collections about the Wright brothers uh, that has brought him here today. Due to his unique research on their lives, in 2000 he was appointed Wilbur and Orville Wright Distinguished Professor of History at North Carolina, oops, sorry, okay. Uh, appointed Wilbur and Orville Wright Distinguished Hist Professor of History at North e East Carolina University, which is a post that he still holds. He also is the founder of World Aloft, an extensive website dedicated to the Wright brothers. And may I present before anything else goes wrong, Larry Tice. Larry?
Uh, it's wonderful to be at the Library of Congress today. Uh, I actually uh, uh, came in this morning to go into the manuscript collection, which I always do. And of course, my card had expired, so I got a new card, and uh, it has just been uh, certified, verified, so I can go in the manuscript collection. I have a copy card, so I can go back down and copy the stuff that I found this morning that I, I want to copy. Uh, my purpose here today, uh, the announced purpose, is to talk about my d new book, uh, uh, Conquering the Sky, The Secret Flights of the Wright Brothers. But uh, being in this place, the uh, Library of Congress, uh, is sort of the beginning point for all of my research on the uh, Wright Brothers. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I have used the Wright Brothers collection at the Library of Congress as a takeoff to initiate uh, a whole new world of research about the uh, Wright brothers. And uh, so let me get this back over here and see if I can operate it. Uh, the, the title I, of this presentation is Scholarizing the Wright brothers. And by that, I mean that I'm trying to uh, elevate research on the Wright brothers to a scholarly level. Uh, there's a lot of stuff written about the Wright brothers that's not particularly scholarly. and. Uh, and that is sort of irritating in a way. Uh, and I've devoted myself to finding new sources about the Wright brothers, of finding uh, new methods of studying old sources and uh, uh, asking questions uh, about the Wright brothers that haven't been asked in the past, perhaps, and uh, developing uh, new methods of, of disseminating the information. Uh, I started out here uh, in North Carolina uh, in Winston-Salem, and uh, this is the logo for my home in, in Winston-Salem. I started out from there to go research the world, and that's what I've been doing for a long time. When I was a kid, uh, we went to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Uh, Winston-Salem is uh, about as far from the Outer Banks as uh, Washington, D.C. is, so uh, you, you know, it's, it takes a while to, to get there and even more time to appreciate it. We're talking about Kill Devil Hills, which uh, I discovered when I was a boy. Uh, I, when, when I was a boy, we went on a family vacation uh, to North Carolina, and I picked up a little paperback book by Fred Kelly, Miracle at Kitty Hawk, and uh, I learned a bunch of things in reading that book. Uh, uh, first of all, the Smithsonian didn't recognize the Wright brothers as the pioneers of powered flight, and that came as a great shock to me. Uh, the Kitty Hawk plane uh, from, uh, from 1903 had been in England until 1948, and it didn't arrive at the Smithsonian until 1948. That was sort of a shock to me. Uh, the Wright brothers were engaged in a patent fight that uh, went all the way up to the First World War, and in fact, the U.S. government had to sort of uh, put the quietus on their patent uh, so that we could go fight a war. Uh, uh, other aviators were sometimes honored as even greater than the Wright brothers in the history of flight. Uh, so anyway, I, I sort of grew up right. Uh, in uh, 1976, I was the North Carolina historian when uh, we had on our license plate uh, a slogan that was first in freedom, and people marched up and down all over North Carolina saying, North Carolina is not first in freedom. And so we replaced First in Freedom with another slogan. It's called First in Flight. And I was the historian that uh, oversaw getting First in Freedom off the license plate and getting First in Flight on the license plate. It was supposed to be there for two years, but if you drive in North Carolina, you'll notice that it's still there. They've never been able to figure out. I guess the fight over First in Freedom was too much, and uh, so they, they don't want to go through that again. I was in North Carolina on the 75th anniversary of the first flight and was one of the organizers of that event, which was a lot of fun. In uh, 1989, I went to the Franklin Institute and I was in charge of the Wright Brothers collection at the Franklin Institute. A lot of people don't know that the Wright Brothers uh, collection materials is divided up into three great parts. Uh, one part is at the Library of Congress, one part is at Wright State University, and the other part, the engineering part, is at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, and I had the chance to play around with all of their engineering stuff when I was there. 1999, I became associated with the First Flight Centennial Commission in North Carolina. 2000, I became the Wilbur Norville Wright Visiting Distinguished Professor at East Carolina. And uh, in 2001 to 2003, I was a faculty fellow at NASA Langley uh, to do research on the Wright brothers. Uh, there are a lot of obstacles 
to scholarizing the Wright brothers. They're big, big obstacles. Uh, most people uh, think they know everything about the Wright brothers, and uh, even people, when they see my new book, they'll say, oh, about December 17th, 1903. And I'll say, no, it's not about December 17th, 1903. And they'll say, well, what's it about? I'll say, it's 1908, not 1903. And they say, well, why 1908? Well, we'll get back to that. Uh, there are hundred bo hundreds of books about the Wright brothers. Virtually all books about the Wright brothers are derivative. And if you uh, read Wright brothers materials, you'll find out that in 1928, somebody made a mistake in citing something about the Wright brothers, and that mistake has been perpetuated in every book written about the Wright brothers. So. Whenever you read about the Wright brothers, you know whether somebody did research or if they're just repeating the errors that other people made. Uh, there's also a public perception about the Wright brothers that they walked on water. And uh, particularly, they walked on water in Ohio. And uh, if you say anything detrimental about the Wright brothers, then you are definitely committing a sin. And I have to say that I have sinned. Uh, so we will see. Uh, there's also this American perception that the Wright brothers story began and ended on December 17th, 1903. That's the beginning and the end and anything else that happened before doesn't matter. Anything that happened after that uh, doesn't really matter because that's the big deal. Uh, the other obstacle is uh, at the bottom of the page there. The biggest bugbear of all in doing research on the Wright brothers is that the Library of Congress in 1953 put together a book called The Papers of Wilbur and Orville Wright, published in 1953, two big fat volumes, and everybody on earth thinks that everything about the Wright brothers is in those two volumes. And uh, that's where I find out, that's where I separate the, the sheep and the goats. Uh, when people say they're writing about the Wright brothers, I say, well, where do you do your research? They say, oh, well, you know, the papers of the Wright brothers are published. And, uh, and that's, that's what I used. I said, well, I'm sorry to say, but uh, there's not much about the Wright brothers in the papers of Wilbur and Orville Wright, if you are interested in the personality of the Wright brothers, if you are interested in the social life of the Wright brothers, if you're interested in anything that happened uh, basically before 1900, if you're interested in anything that happened basically after, eh, no, well, 1903, there are things in the, in the published papers of the Wright brothers after 1903, but it gets spottier and spottier and spottier and spottier after that. Uh, what I tell, what I ask people, they say, have you worked in the papers of the Wright brothers at the Library of Congress? And if they say, oh, no, no, everything's published, uh, now they say, well, you know, everything's online uh, because the, the Wright brothers papers have been digitized and all you have to do is go online and do research on the Wright brothers. And if they tell me that, then I know they don't know anything about the Wright brothers <laughs> because there's so much that is not online. So anyway, I'm going to tell you about 15 projects, since we have three hours that I'm working on, 15 projects that I have been working on using the springboard of the Wright brothers. Uh, my goal originally was to collect and edit for publication all the Wright brothers' letters and diaries from North Carolina. Uh, and uh, the focus of my research was to examine the Wright brothers' papers at the Library of Congress. And uh, so I came to the Library of Congress years ago and started going through the papers here and found out that most of the things the Wright brothers wrote from North Carolina, from Kitty Hawk, have never been published. And uh, actually, most of the interesting things written by the Wright brothers from Kitty Hawk have never been published. And that was pretty shocking. Uh, <clears throat> just as one example of something that hasn't been published, which caught my eye early on, this is a letter <clears throat> from Orville to Catherine Wright, 29th of September, 1902. We have three regular occupations now with occasionally a fourth, eating, sleeping, chasing pigs and mice, and gliding now and then when the weather is favorable and the machine is not in the repair shop. I'm getting along finely in French. I've read all the stories of Le Chien de Brisquet and the fables, and uh, most people don't know that the Wright brothers were studying French with their, at the Outer Banks. And uh, then uh, Orville, in the same letter, talks about something that's very interesting to me, which came back to me later. He says, that little mouse has begun his gnawing. They had problems with mice. Uh, on the top shelf over my head, the little fellow will make a poet out of me if he isn't careful. 
Uh, I think I could beat Burns on Hollow onto a field mouse. You wee blankety blank mousey, what are you doing in our housey, etc. And I'll tell you about what the, the Wright brothers did about the mousey and their housey. Uh, they also in the Wright brothers papers, there are uh, lots and lots of letters from uh, the outer bankers to the Wright brothers. And uh, I find these letters to be uh, extremely interesting. And this is a uh, uh, a letter from William Tate. There are many, many William Tate letters in the Wright Brothers papers which have not been published. Uh, uh, project, we just finished Project 1. Project 2, uh, illustrating that book that I was going to do about reports from Kitty Hawk, I decided I would illustrate it. And uh, so if you want to illustrate uh, the papers, uh, the papers of the Wright Brothers from Kitty Hawk, the best place to go is to the Library of Congress because the Library of Congress uh, uh, actually has the original glass plate negatives uh, of the Wright brothers. <clears throat> and uh, these glass plate negatives are very interesting. What you're looking at right here is a glass plate negative. And uh, I have to uh, pause for just a second to uh, say thanks to uh, 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 my buddy Leonard Bruno uh, who has been unfailing in helping me to figure out how to get access to and understand things that are at the Wright Brother at, at the Library of Congress, and it's a never-ending task because uh, I write Lynn all the time saying, "How do I do this? How do I do that?" And he is unfailing in answering al almost immediately within the hour, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, for somebody who works for a government entity, but <laughs> and and uh, uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, uh, Je Jeffrey Flannery, who, who's in the room. And uh, I was waiting till my grandson got here because I wanted to tell something about Jeffrey so that my grandson would hear, but he's not here yet. So I'll wait until he gets here, and then I'll talk about that. But Jeffrey uh, uh, runs the uh, manuscript reading room, and uh, and uh, he runs it uh, with a very uh, uh, tight uh, noose on everything that goes on in the room, which is extremely important uh, to everybody. Uh, but in any case, uh, thanks to the Library of Congress, when I started studying the images of the Wright brothers, uh, the Library of Congress had uh, scanned the glass plate negatives uh, and scanned them uh, at very high resolution of uh, 1200 to 1500 DPI, which was extremely important in this study of, uh, um, uh, this is another one of the, uh, the Im images uh, uh, in the Wright Brothers collection. And uh, uh, now we're to project number three. Uh, I, based on uh, the papers and on, and on the photographs, I created a, a, uh, a, a digital exhibit, which you can find on the Joyner Library website at East Carolina University, uh, which has lots and lots of materials. Uh, on this website, there are four major components, the diaries of the Wright brothers from the Library of Congress, uh, the photos from the Library of Congress with lots of other, other photographs as well, uh, publications about the Wright brothers in North Carolina, and weather data. Uh, one of the things I discovered in doing research on this is that there is unbelievable weather data. When I talk to people about flying at Kitty Hawk, and the recreation of the first flight uh, in, in uh, December 17, 2003, the people who were trying to create these replica airplanes, they said, well, the one thing we don't know is the barometric pressure, pressure uh, that the Wright brothers uh, tried to fly in. I said, well, you know what? We can, give, we can get you all the weather data you would ever want because right next door to where the Wright brothers were trying to fly was the Kill Devil Hills Life Saving Station. And at the Kill Devil Hills Life Saving Station, every single day of the existence of the Kill Devil Hills Life Saving Station, they created a log. And all of these logs are in the National Archives. And they're wonderful logs because it will tell you the weather conditions uh, on that particular day. It will also tell you who all the lifesavers were, who were on duty, what they were doing during the day, where they went. The lifesavers had to go from one life-saving station to another and make connection with the people in the next life-saving station on patrols every day, which also then tells you a lot about how information got out about what the Wright brothers were doing because the lifesavers were the people who spread the information. Uh, uh, 
the uh, so I discovered these logs, and as far as I can tell, nobody has ever used the logs of these uh, life-saving stations. They're in the National Archives, and all of the life-saving stations have these logs. The ones for the southeast are in the southeastern region of the National Archives in Atlanta. Uh, Project 5, we're moving along. Uh, hidden images. Once I started studying these images, and this is one of the uh, glass plate negatives that got a little messed up. Uh, in 1913, there was a flood in Dayton, and all the glass, plate, glass plates got wet, and they got damaged as a consequence. But when I look at these images, everybody who's interested in aviation, they will say, now, what kind of plane is that? What kind of control system do they have? And, and me, not being an expert in flight or aviation, I'm looking at other things, and I'll say, oh, what are those bumps down there on the horizon? And I noticed that in all the guides to the uh, uh, to images about the Wright brothers, it says that uh, this plane, this uh, glider, is flying over Kitty Hawk. Well, I know that Kitty Hawk is not on the beach. Kitty Hawk is surrounded by trees. And so that cannot be Kitty Hawk. But all the finding aids will tell you that that's Kitty Hawk under there. Well, that's not Kitty Hawk. That is... This is a blown up image, and it doesn't come through this projector very well. But this is an image of the Kill Devil Hills Life Saving Station. Well, now, when most people think of the Life Saving Station, they think of a building sitting out there on the sand. But the Life Saving Station was a complex of buildings because during the hurricane season, all the Life Savers would move out and live at the Life Saving Station. They would take their families with them, and they would live in these houses uh, surrounding the Life Saving Station. Uh, this is a, another image from the Library of Congress collection. Uh, and I show this one because it is all messed up, of course. And you'll notice that Wilbur, well, do we know that's Wilbur? There's somebody standing there in the shadow. But when you blow this up, you can see all kinds of interesting things. There's Wilbur, and there's Wilbur sewing on a wing. And this is a very important image, as I'll tell you a little bit later, because in the back of this image, you can see something right here, uh, which, you know, I didn't notice when I was doing this, but fortunately we blew it up and published this image so that somebody else could come along later and figure out something else. Uh, Project 6, uh, and uh, the centennial of the first flight, I did a photo exhibit, uh, which uh, I uh, had at, the, uh, at Kitty Hawk. And, uh, and I showed lots and lots of images from the Library of Congress collection. This is one. This is a glass plate negative from, uh, uh, it's actually from December, uh, oh, I showed the exhibit December 17th, 2003. This image is of December 14th, uh, 1903. This is three days before the powered flight when they tried to fly and actually did fly, but nobody pays any attention to the flight on December 14th because it was only, it was too short and it was eight seconds, I think. But in any case, you see an image of the Wright Brothers plane. Uh, you see people gathered around. And when I showed this exhibit uh, at Kitty Hawk in 2003, what do you think people were interested in? They walked up one after another and they'd say, you know who those kids are? And I'd say, no, do you? And they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, this is my grandfather right here. And uh, this is, believe it or not, this is my grandmother right here. And so anyway, I thought, well, this is very interesting. And so I took down their names. And, uh, and you know, 20 minutes later, somebody would come up and they'd say, do you know who those people are? <laughs> and I'd say, uh, well, I think I know most of them. Uh, who do you think they are? I'd say, well, this is my grandfather here. And, uh, and, and this is my great great uncle. And I'd write down their names. And you know, 30 minutes later, somebody else would come up and they'll say, Do you know who these people are? <laughs> I say, I'm getting the picture of who they are. And, uh, and, it, and it never fails. I mean, I, last Saturday, I was down in uh, uh, Columbia, North Carolina, in uh, a diner. And this guy came in and sat down beside of me. and. And he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a historian. And he said, what do you work on? The Wright Brothers. He said, you know what? My grandfather saw the first flight. 
Well, all I want to tell you is that the Wright Brothers story is alive and growing on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. But that was what came from showing this image down there. And so anyway, we blow these up and, you know, to, unfortunately, even with the best resolution, we can't quite get a, a face out of there. But we know who the dogs were. That's Blackie. Uh, but as a result of studying the, the images, uh, I was able to do a book called Hidden Images, Discovering Details in the Kitty Hawk Photographs. Uh, uh, this book uh, was uh, it's very interesting. If you go online now, it's, it's out of print right now, but if you go online, you can have your own copy for about $130 uh, because it's become a collector's item immediately. Hopefully it will be in print again soon. Ah, Project 8, the Kitty Hawk table. Remember I showed you that picture of Wilbur and what was in the, in the picture behind him? Well, this is the table that is shown in that image. And uh, this is me being sacrilegious with my hand without a glove on, on the table. Uh, but in any case, uh, I got a call from a guy uh, about a year and a half ago. He said, I think I have the original table from the Wright Brothers uh, Kitty Hawk Camp, uh, 1902. And I, of course, of course, I didn't believe him. And uh, and I said, could you send me some some uh, digital images of the pic of the table? He sent them to me, and I looked at at them, and I thought, ooh, ooh, ah, uh, ooh, ooh, this could be the table. So we got the table, we brought it up to East Carolina, and we studied it in great detail. And uh, and uh, fortunately, we had this image, uh, which is in the the Library of Congress collection, and uh, we could see. This is from a print. This is not from the digital image. We can see the table right there. And this image can be blown up unbelievably. So that we were actually able to match the, see that right there? That's a nail. And uh, the nail and the table is in the same spot. And, uh, and these little stars around here, they're all in the table. So we were able to verify based on the photograph that it was the original table. But that's not the only reason why I decided it was the original table. We analyzed it, we measured it, we recorded it, we did all kinds of things. But then by use of uh, this little digital image, we were able to determine that the, ta the top of the table uh, was not the original to the table. The, the Wright brothers made the top. They slapped the top on, this, on a writing desk. And the table top consists of, of, uh, of, of four parts, this part, this part, each of these parts are sides of a shipping crate. And on the bottom of one of these it says two Wright brothers, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, which I assumed was forged. Uh, but after studying it, I realized these were from, from shipping crates because this, this, this is hung in glue. These, these look like random boards, but it's all hung in glue and they're joined. But the, the coup de grace was that these two pieces right here are seven eighths inch square uh, spruce uh, boards, uh, which is the material that the Wright brothers used in making their airplanes. And uh, so they took some scraps from their pile of wood for making their planes and they used it to widen this table a little bit. Uh, I've also done some international research, uh, uh, Project 9. I've been to Le Mans, I've been to Rome, I've been to Poe, I've been to all the places that the Wright brothers flew in Europe. And we think we have a lot of photographs about the Wright brothers and flying. They got oodles and oodles more photographs in France and, and Italy than we do because uh, in 1908, uh, photography was almost as popular as digital photography is in the U.S. today. Everybody had a camera and everybody was taking pictures and, and there are thousands and thousands of photographs uh, there. Uh, but I was able to study things, you know, like uh, this is the, the building in Le Mans. It looks an awful lot like the building that the Wright brothers had at uh, uh, Kitty Hawk. Uh, and more photographs. Project 9, uh, which leads to the book, Researching 1908. Uh, I was interested in 1908 because the Wright, that's the year the Wright brothers were discovered. We think that the Wright brothers flew in 1903, and as soon as it was announced that they flew, they became household names worldwide. They actually didn't because they were very secretive. They were not discovered until 1908. So one of the riddles that I tried to uncover in 1908 is that the, that photograph that we all know of the Wright brothers' first flight, the Wright brothers hid that photograph and didn't publish it 
until long after there were many other photographs of Wright Brothers planes in the air. Uh, but uh, the Collier's Weekly and the New York Herald hired a renowned photographer in 1908 to go to the Outer Banks to take the first picture of a Wright Brothers airplane in flight. And they hired James Hare, who was really a renowned photographer, and he went to the Outer Banks and he made uh, glass plate negatives. These are lantern slides, uh, uh, which I discovered uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, these are lantern slides that he made to tell his research on the trail of the Wright brothers. And these lantern slides uh, are at the University of Texas. Uh, and this is a portrait of, uh, of James Hare. He always took a picture of himself uh, whenever he was taking pictures. Uh, and uh, they're wonderful pictures. This is a, a picture of uh, the reporters headed to the Outer Banks, uh, one of his images. Uh, this is a, another uh, image in the series of the reporters arriving at Kill Devil Hills. I love this picture because this is after the reporters came in and didn't realize that there were chiggers and fleas at the Outer Banks. And uh, they got very uh, bitten. Uh, and so anyway, this is a blow up of the image of the first flight, uh, the first published photo uh, taken by James Hare. But using that as sort of a takeoff, I created a website uh, called uh, uh, World Aloft uh, 1908. And uh, if you want to look it up, it's just www.worldaloft.org. And, uh, and uh, on this website, uh, I have loads and loads of materials about everything the Wright brothers were doing in uh, uh, 1908. Uh, then based on the additional research, I created an exhibit uh, on the Wright Brothers in 1908. And, uh, and this exhibit has lots of the photographs from, from James Hare, lots of photographs from the uh, Library of Congress. And uh, this eventuated in an exhibit that was at Kitty Hawk in 2008. Uh, it is now at the North Carolina Transportation Museum in Spencer, North Carolina, uh, which can be seen today. And this, of course, led to the book, uh, uh, which is, is uh, the topic of today's discussion. And, uh, but anyway, I don't want to stop there. I wanted to go to project 13 and 14. Uh, uh, well, uh, 12, 12 is the book, and uh, publicizing the book. But then, once we discovered this table, the table has a story of its own. Uh, I thought that the table ought to go on exhibit at the Wright Brothers Memorial at Kitty Hawk. And uh, unfortunately, the Park Service is not set up to deal with valuable objects at, uh, at their park sites. And so the Park Service said, no, we can't handle something that is worth as much as that table. And so the first time the table was exhibited was at the North Carolina Museum of History. And uh, this is a little exhibit at the entrance of the uh, museum. And then after it was there at the Museum of History, uh, the owner, uh, I don't own the table, it's owned privately, uh, uh, offered it to the Smithsonian to go at the Air and Space Museum. The Air and Space Museum said, lovely, we would love to have it. And we were going to put it right beside of the 1903 flyer. And uh, it would be there today because they announced on March 1st that it was there, uh, but you may remember that in February oh, snow. there was snow. <laughs> and so the snow uh, impeded lots of things in Washington, and one of the things that it impeded, it was it impeded the roof staying up in the building where the table was stored, and the roof collapsed uh, on the, the Smithsonian Storage Building, and the table was in the building. And uh, fortunately, the table was not destroyed. <laughs> uh, but as a result of the collapse of the building, of course, uh, all of the uh, general inspectors uh, in the federal government arrived to determine uh, the damages and stuff like that. So it took weeks before the table could be pulled out of the storage building. But it is now secure. But it is not yet on exhibit. Uh, but it should be on exhibit 
sometime in the next couple of weeks at the Air and Space Museum. But try to go by and see it. It's a very interesting, uh, as Tom Crouch describes it, you know, it's interesting to put the, a, a flying machine made by the hands of the Wright brothers there and put beside it a table which was made by the hands of the Wright brothers. Uh, uh, the current project I'm working on, which brought me back into the collection this morning, manuscript collection, is that I found uh, uh, several months ago a series of targets uh, which the Wright brothers created by hand and which they used in uh, 1908 to do target practice at Kitty Hawk. Uh, most people don't know that the guys who walked on water always had guns with them at uh, the Outer Banks. They always had guns with them. And uh, they used guns for lots of reasons, uh, uh, to shoot birds for one thing, to shoot pigs for another thing. And uh, remember I told you about the mousey and the Wright brothers housey? They got so fed up with the mice that they shot the mice. But they missed the mice and shot the building. So it was, it was always a, you know, a comedy of errors as to what they did. But in any case, I found this uh, exhibit right outside of a real estate office in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And I said, what have you got? And the guy said, oh, well, those are targets, you know, used by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. And so I started reading them. And sure enough, one letter I haven't been able to find in the Library of Congress collection is this letter from Orville the lady who owned the targets saying yes these are the targets from 1908 and yes if you look at the targets you can see all kinds of uh, interesting things well uh, th this photograph is not in the Library of Congress collection this is at Wright State but we know that they had guns because here's a picture of Orville in 1911 cleaning his rifle uh, but anyway these targets had been badly treated they were glued to uh, foam core board and 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 it was it was terrible when we started trying to pull this apart and uh, uh, but anyway we finally got them apart here are the targets it was hard to tell how many targets there were because they'd all sort of fallen around in there but there are four targets this is the 50 yard target we know it's the 50 yard target because it says 50 yards on it and uh, and it has initials down there WW uh, and uh, this is the Sunday target, we know, because it says Sunday <laughs> on it. And, uh, and so we know they shot on Sunday. And uh, they, don't, they didn't do other things on Sunday, but they shot on Sunday. And we know that this, this one says OW at the bottom. And uh, then this is the Wednesday target. A piece of it's missing. We know it's Wednesday because it says Wednesday. And this one says down at the corner, Chaz. And... Uh, then uh, this is the Thursday target, and I like the Thursday target. Uh, it says Thursday too, and it has OW. But anyway, what you can do with photography is then play around with it and see how, how you can see things. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a contrast to try to pull out uh, stuff that's written on there. And uh, when you show it in context, you can see the Thursday, the OW. Uh, you can also see uh, a bullet hole with a W inside of it. Charlie Furness was their mechanic who was with them in 1908. And uh, this is a, a close-up of the Sunday. And you can see right in the center there that uh, the O, Orville, uh, almost got the center of the bullseye. Uh, but in any case, uh, I took these targets, because I don't know much about guns, uh, to the State Bureau of Investigation in North Carolina and asked them to look at them. And, and, uh, and they helped me to understand. And based on that photograph I showed you, and analyzing the targets, uh, we know that the Wright brothers were shooting from 50 yards. Uh, we know that the OW, the WW, the CHAZ means that that was the person who got the closest to the bullseye when they were shooting that day, and that was the winner of the contest. And we know that the contest they were doing was to see who could get the closest to the bullseye. It was not to add up points for getting within a certain circles. It was who got the closest. We know that they were shooting uh, not from a prone position, but from a kneeling position. They weren't at a standing position. They were at a kneeling position when they shot because the accuracy reflects that. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, so anyway, Project 15 and forward. I want to do an edition of the Kitty Hawk Papers of Wilbur Norville Wright. And, 
and uh, uh, and that's what I set out to do. And unfortunately, I now have four thousand pages, and that's a big book. That's way too big for a book. Uh, I'm still exploring the 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 Library of Congress papers, and uh, I said I came into the manuscript collection this morning. I found a folder that I had never seen before, which has loads of information about the lady who owned the targets. And, uh, the, and you know, the, in the, if you know the Wright Brothers collection, they're all uh, basically organized alphabetically. And if you know the name of a person, you can look up that person's name. But if somebody along the way decided to take it out of the, 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 uh, the, um, the alphabetical listing and put it in some other folder, then it looks like they're not there. But all of, of Orville's correspondence with this woman is in another file which is labeled reconstruction of the 1905 flyer and not under her name uh, but there are about a dozen letters in there Lynn which I discovered this morning which is wonderful uh, but in any case uh, uh, then I would like to do an annotated catalog of all of the right photographs uh, Library of Congress and other places as I mentioned uh, almost all of the Wright brothers photographs are mislabeled uh, including the ones at the Library of Congress and uh, and it's unfortunate that they are because uh, uh, we, we do know who the people are and we do know what the places were and at some point there really ought to be uh, a detailed uh, annotated uh, guide would help, which would help to clarify all the misinformation uh, that's out there about the, the photographs and of course my last part is wait for watching for right stories as yet untold and for artifacts as yet unseen which I keep finding all along now uh, my, my, uh, my son and his wife and, and my grandson Aiden arrived and I wanted to tell something about uh, working at the Library of Congress uh, and unfortunately Jeff Lannery left he yeah he had to leave but but one of the things I wanted to say and uh, is that uh, working in the reading room at the Library of Congress it's like uh, Aiden it's like your your new your new dog Abby you know, when you work, when people arrive in the search room, they, first of all, they want to know if you've ever been here before. And uh, if you haven't been here before, then you start getting the indoctrination of, about how you operate in the reading room. And, uh, and then, you know, you have to talk, you have to teach a, a puppy uh, where to go to pee and poop and stuff like that. And, uh, and in the reading room, uh, you, before you can photocopy anything, you have to go up to the front desk and ask people, can I copy this? Even if you've done it a thousand times, you still have to go every, every single time and ask. And if you don't ask before you go photocopy, somebody will walk over and say, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, did you ask <laughs> to, to, to copy that? And you'll say, no, I forgot. I've been a thousand times and I forgot this time. But anyway, Aiden, when you do research at the Library of Congress someday, you have to follow the rules. You have to do it right or they won't let you have stuff. But in any case, that's my story on researching the Wright brothers. I'll stop there. And if there's any time left, I'll answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. About the book, <laughs> the the book is uh, yeah, the book is a detailed account of what happened in in uh, May, April and May of 1908, and uh, uh, the Wright brothers went back to Kitty Hawk in 1908, uh, hoping to test uh, some new uh, de new devices. They wanted to sit up for the first time. They wanted to control the plane by hand. Uh, they wanted to carry a passenger for the first time. And they wanted to be able to fly for an hour uh, with a passenger. And they went back to Kitty Hawk, number one, because they needed the wind. They needed wind of 21 miles per hour, which was the ideal flying conditions for them. They flew into the wind, not with the wind, of course. Uh, they wanted the sand so they could crash and not be killed and uh, and number three they wanted privacy uh, because if you know if you know anything about test flying and the Wright brothers knew it all too well nine out of ten nine out of ten attempts are failures and uh, they wanted to fail you know in anonymity 
and uh, and so when they went back to Kitty Hawk in 1908, they were hoping to do secret flights. However, as soon as they landed at Kitty Hawk, the the outer bankers started wagging, the lifesavers started going from station to station, saying the Wright brothers are here, the Wright brothers are here, and immediately rumors started seeping out of the outer banks saying that the Wright brothers were flying, they were flying up and down the coast, they were flying out over the Atlantic Ocean, and, uh, and uh, Wilbur Norville got a great deal of fun out of this because the article started appearing before they even had their machine out of the box. And, uh, and of course, the, the stories about their flying were so unbelievably exaggerated that uh, newspapers throughout the world sent their best reporters and photographers to North Carolina to get the story of what the Wright brothers were doing. And uh, so it was just a comedy of errors because the reporters all came from New York and Washington and London and Chicago and everywhere. They bought their outfits at Urban Outfitters and, and, uh, and at, uh, you know, they, they got ready, you know, they got in style to go to the Outer Banks and they arrived on the Outer Banks and they had no idea that there were chiggers and fleas and, and things like that. I should get to the book. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so anyway, the reporters were told that if the, Wright brothers, if, if the Wright brothers knew they were there, the Wright brothers wouldn't fly. And so the reporters decided they had to hide in the woods, which is what they did, which is why they got eaten by chiggers. Uh, but they also said, if you want to see the Wright brothers fly, you have to be there at 7 a.m. Well, you know, reporters, they, they always have hangovers, and so it was very hard for them to get up at 4 and get out across the water to Kill Devil Hills by 7 a.m., but they did. And I showed you one of the photographs of them walking across the sand there. Uh, but in any case, they got there, and they would watch the Wright brothers flying from 7 to 9 a.m., maybe 10 a.m., and then they would pack up. They were so miserable, they would go back over to Manio. And... Unfortunately, the Wright brothers' flights occurred after that, later in the day, when the flying conditions were good. So the reporters who were sent with big money to get the story were back sitting in Manio when the flying went on. And so the only access they had to information about what was going on was the lifesavers in their little boats coming over to Manio saying, you should have seen the Wright brothers. They were doing flips and all kinds of stuff. And so the the reporters would write what the, what the lifesavers said. And uh, so the stories that went out bore no relationship whatsoever to, to what uh, the Wright brothers were doing. Uh, then the, on May 14th, uh, 1908, which was the day that the Wright brothers decided to do their first passenger flight, and they decided to try to fly for an hour that day, the reporters were there, and James Hare was there, and James Hare got a photograph of the first or maybe the second passenger flight on the morning of May 14th. And so that we have that photograph. So then, immediately afterwards, the reporters had heard that, that Wilbur was going to try to fly for an hour. So Wilbur got up, and he flew for seven and a half minutes, and then the plane went behind a sand dune and didn't return. And so the reporters thought, oh, well, you know, he just landed back there. He's probably going to tinker with the engine and stuff like that. So they went back to Manio, wrote their stories, and they said, this morning we saw the first passenger flight in the history of humanity, and uh, Wilbur uh, was going to set the world's record for flying, and, uh, but his plane disappeared behind the uh, sand dunes. And so anyway, they sent out their stories. We have the stories they wrote. We know what they gave to the, to the telegraph key operator. Uh, and the telegraph key operator monkeyed with their stories, made the stories better. But on that particular day, the lifesavers arrived in the afternoon and said, Wilbur crashed. Wilbur was, the plane was smashed to smithereens. And so the, the reporters wrote their story about this great flight that occurred on the morning of May 14th. And then they sent an addition to their story that the Wright brothers' plane was crashed. Wilbur may have been hurt. They probably will never fly again. And that was the story that appeared throughout the world the next day.
was that the Wright brothers crashed. So the real story of them doing this passenger flight and, uh, and having this machine that would really do what they said it would do was lost. So anyway, the, the, the secret flights is about their attempts to fly secretly, but then all of the crazy things that happen. One of the things I tell you about the Wright brothers that I talk about in the book uh, and I try to talk about their personalities in this book because Wilbur and Orville were very different kinds of people. Uh, um, but one of the other things is that on, on uh, uh, the morning of May 14th, uh, the Wright brothers could go out and they could fly. And, uh, but be, once the story went out about their flights and the, all the stories about what was happening at Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers were never able to do anything privately for the rest of their lives. Uh, they became, on that day, superstars throughout the world. And, uh, and if you, I traced what happened to Wilbur and Orville after this, these flights, and they never had a moment of privacy again. Uh, well, until after Wilbur died in 1912. But Wilbur was hounded by reporters uh, until the day he died, and, and so was Orville until that time. But in any case, it was when they became known uh, throughout the world. Yes? They, they always use catapults except on the Outer Banks. Uh, uh, well, I mean, once they discovered they needed a catapult. But uh, uh, everywhere they flew uh, uh, until they put wheels on much later, uh, and they were able to take off from, they, they actually did a takeoff in Rome in 1909. It was the first time they had wheels on a plane. But, but in any case, uh, they always used the catapult at Dayton. They always used the catapult at uh, Fort Myer. They used the catapult at Le Mans, at Poe, uh, for all of their flights uh, uh, because they couldn't take off uh, without the catapult. The, the reason why they didn't need a catapult at Kitty Hawk was because of the, of the wind. Yes? Well, you obviously have a lot on your plate just with the two brothers, um, but about their sister, um, you know, there's, uh, there's always been conflicting re um, uh, reports about Catherine, whether she financially supported them. I mean, it's pretty clear that she emotionally supported them. But I was always um, disappointed to read, and maybe you could shed light on how true this is, that when Catherine decided in her 50s, That's right. You, you mentioned that you get into their personalities. Can you kind of talk about that? Or what yeah, about yeah, I, I can. First of all, since you brought up the, the subject of Catherine, I, I have to acknowledge that I'm in love with Catherine. So I, I have a love affair with her. She, she was an unbelievable woman who supported the Wright brothers and, uh, and was a, a woman of her time who was very independent, uh, very independent thinking. She was involved in the suffragette movement. She was involved in organizing women to do things. Uh, she was a professional. She, she was a school teacher. Uh, she taught classics, uh, Latin and Greek, and, and she taught up until the day Orville crashed at Fort Myer, and then she never taught again. Uh, and yes, it is true that, uh, 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 well, the way I tell the story is like this. Um, a lot of people say, well, what about the Wright brothers' descendants? Uh, well, the Wright brothers, that is Wilbur and Orville, had no descendants. Uh, they were not married. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, as best I can tell, they both were completely allergic to women. And, uh, and they, they, they just really could not deal with women. I, I have a picture of Orville with Amelia Earhart, which I show when I talk about this book in bookstores and, and and, and it's, it's a wonderful picture because uh, it's the two of them together on December 17, 1933, the 30th anniversary of the first powered flight. And, uh, and in this picture, uh, Amelia is being her sexy self. And, uh, and Orville is, looks, is going like... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he looks like a deer in the, you know, in the headlights. He's about to be run over. And... And so anyway, I, I have all their correspondence, some of it's in the, in the Library of Congress, uh, about that date. And, uh, and uh, we know that Orville was completely unnerved by Amelia. 
I mean, he just could not, he could not handle being around her. She was just too hot for him. And, uh, and, and that's pretty much the way they were. But when, uh, when Wilbur died, uh, well, well, first of all, when Orville crashed, uh, Catherine went to his side and was his nurse. And, uh, and then they became a pair, uh, Orville and, and Catherine. And, and they, 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 they were identified as a couple, actually, uh, uh, up until 1926. And in 1926, uh, one day, uh, Catherine said, uh, and there were loads and loads of letters that document this. Catherine said, I'm going to tell Orville I'm going to get married. And, uh, and she wrote 90 letters describing how she was going to tell him. And then she would chicken out every time. And then finally she did tell him. And Orville said, uh, you're going to get married? What do you mean you're going to get married? And, uh, and he would say, you don't know anybody. And she'd say, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I, 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 and, he said, and she told him who it was. And he said, you're not going to marry that snake. And, uh, and uh, she said, yes, I am going to. And, and, and he said, well, I'll never speak to you again as long as you live, as long as we live. And uh, and she didn't. I mean, he didn't. He he refused to acknowledge the the, the marriage, uh, and the husband, uh, who it was his third the husband's third marriage, and that bothered Orville too. But in any case, uh, Catherine was extremely important to the Wright brothers. Uh, I like to describe her as being the 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 business manager. Uh, uh, they were gone all the time and she kept everything together while they were gone. Uh, she had a very hard time dealing with the mechanics because the mechanics didn't want to be ordered around by anybody in skirts. But, uh, but in any case, it's a wonderful story, long story. Larry, yeah? um, we need to conclude in okay. a minute, but I'd like to ask you, following along with what Audrey said, maybe you could give us each a quick little personality sketch of the two brothers, and okay. then we will co conclude for the uh, book. <laughs> Okay. Signing. Okay. 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 Uh, Wilbur was the visionary. Wilbur was the dreamer. Uh, Wilbur came up with all the great ideas, uh, and he turned to Orville and said, "Do it." And uh, Orville said, uh, "That can't be done, but this can be done." And so Orville would make that happen. So uh, they were both geniuses, but Wilbur was the visionary genius. Uh, Orville was the the practical genius, um, and. Uh, uh, it, it, one of the stories I talk about in the book is in 1908 when Wilbur left Kitty Hawk. He went to France, and he basically left all of the Wright brothers' business to Orville. Uh, and he said, Orville, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. And Orville, the shy person who believed that he could never speak in public and refused ever to speak in public, who believed he couldn't write a sentence, uh, who believed that he couldn't deal with reporters, in that summer of 1908, he did all of those things. And one of the things Wilbur said to him, and I'll end on this, Wilbur said, you know what? History is going to pass us by if we don't write our story. And so from France, he wrote all these letters to Orville saying, write our story and get it in the, in the, in the magazine. And Orville, who believed that he could not write a sentence, wrote a story for Century Magazine, which appeared in September 1908, about how we flew, and that was the only history ever written by either brother of uh, how they flew. It's a good article. Wow. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, okay. thank you, Larry. It was a wonderful talk. We got history from the ground up, the ground level look from a historian who's uh, done a wonderful job in carrying on and telling the world more about the Wright brothers. So that's really been great. We're now going to uh, have a book signing. The books are out back, and uh, you'll have a chance to talk with Larry Tice again. And thank you very much for joining us. One more round of applause. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.